the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Now the phrase uh, that which the apostle uses at the beginning of our text here uh, speaks of the spiritual reasoning capacity of an individual. I would just want to say a word of this at the beginning of it, that he, he recognizes that if there's going to be any kind of advancement in the brethren here, uh, that uh, it's going to be through them understanding and comprehending by faith the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the way it's going to happen. That, that edification isn't a feeling, you know. It's, it's an intelligent process. Uh, such is the experience of the life of faith. It has more to do with intelligent fellowship with our Lord based upon confidence of things which we've been given to understand in the Spirit than it does with feelings and emotional experiences. And we have a lot of this in our day. A lot of religion is you know, dominated by this, but this is, this is not the case. This is a very intelligent thing. This is... The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. So, so Paul, as he's asking this of the Lord, this is what he's desiring for them, that, that they would be able to, to have this capacity. Now, all throughout the scripture, the, the gospel is presented a, as a message of enlightenment. This is the, the tone that it's set in. Uh, Christ is said to have brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Uh, to, to be brought to this state of enlightenment is, in essence, to, to know God. For in, in God, all things are most clearly and brightly seen. We know that God is the only true source of light. Thus, the apostle speaks of him. He says, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. At all. This is a, a thread that's woven throughout all of Scripture. We, we see this uh, the conflict in between light and darkness over and over again. Uh, it's the... Um, Godhead is inexorably associated with light, mm -hmm. with something that, that reveals, which shines along, uh, the, what's contained in the darkness can't be hidden in the, in the presence of this light. Uh, speaking of the coming of the Christ in the world, we talked about this last night, that those who sat in darkness, they saw a great light whenever Jesus came into the world. So this is it. In in this, God is is light, and in Him there's no darkness. There's no variableness, nor another shadow of turning. He is the Father of lights. Amen. Now, as it concerns our text this afternoon, when we were without Him, we were in darkness. This is the the state which we were in. Uh, we weren't able to understand these things, and we weren't actually able to see them. We were, we were blind. This, uh, the eyes of our understanding, this capacity, we didn't even have this capacity. Uh, as, as far as that goes, we weren't able to see th the things concerning our own souls that we're able to see now, and the things about God who created us. We, we couldn't see that we were subject to Him and that we had sinned against Him. And this is something that happened to us when we were enlightened in Christ Jesus. Suddenly we, we, we were able to see that, that we had sinned against the God who created us and that we were subject to him. And on, on the day this happened, we were also able to see that his son died for us. We're also able to see that God had made a provision that we didn't have to be blind, that we didn't have to be dead, we didn't have to be in this condition. When our eyes were open, we didn't have to be as we were sometimes in darkness. Yeah. We didn't have to be involved in unfruitful works of Amen. darkness. Amen. Now, there was, there was a, a, a provision that we didn't have to be under the power of this darkness anymore. It was a, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened. Now, uh, um, as we come to the Lord, we, we begin to see other things. As, uh, um, as this is opening up to us, as our eyes begin to open, it's like um, whenever Ananias received his sight, you know, it, it, things, come, things come back, or the man who saw things as trees walking, you know. It's, it's like whenever you first come, you could just kind of see things as kind of hazy, you know. You, you see the basic things. You see the very foundational things but as you grow in christ as you are able to see more and more of the truth of the gospel there are some things that uh, you may, may not even necessarily be unlawful things but you, you're you things become more clear you know you'll be able to see things in, in a greater clarity you'll be able to see that's a waste of time you know that's something that's hindering me as you, you are able to understand this hope that we're, we're being called to, you're actually able to see the reality of the world around you in a way that you were never able to see it before. You're, you're able to, to make 
uh, decisions more consistently than you were ever, ever able to. We find ourselves sh actually shaping every decision that we make in the world in the light of this, this hope that has come that we're moving towards, that it wouldn't hinder us in our quest for heaven. Uh, this is the prayer which the apostle is asking for this brethren, that they would be able to comprehend that the Lord would give them to know the hope of his calling, not just on paper or in rope, but that they might live according to the reality of it, that they, they might know it to the intent that they might live according to it. That ye may know. This is not a simplistic knowledge. It's not one that's informational, so to speak. It's not like a textbook knowledge. It's experiential in nature. It's something that's not simply transplanted into our minds in aggregate as like a head knowledge. You know, when we come into Christ, it says we're given the mind of Christ. Well, that doesn't mean that, you know, the book of Romans is now implanted in your head. You know, it's, it's not on that wise. It's a... It's a uh, it's learned intimately. It's a fellowship on an individual basis by faith in the Spirit, through, through the, our fellowship with God. The knowledge of God is likened more to a spiritual capacity. It's, it's like a realm of reasoning ability more than a body of facts. Now, this is evident within our text that this knowledge comes when the ability that the person has to reason spiritually is opened up. It's when their eyes are able to see things that can't be seen by, just by their mere eyes in the world, that's when they will know. And this we can see that the primary means of advancing and understanding in the kingdom is through revelation. And that's the revelation that was articulated through a specific message, not in generalities. And also, it's the essence, that's the gospel, that's the message that he is, he is revealing this through. And that the essence of this gospel, of the message, the core message, is hope. That is uh, the focus of the new covenant. And we, we notice here that the apostle did not pray that their eyes of their understanding would be enlightened, that they might know how they need to treat their wives and their children, or how they might need to obey their parents, how they might need to uh, be better um, servants in their jobs, and how they might need to manage their money, you know. I, I think that's what a lot of people are praying for today, you know. And it's not that these things are wrong, but this is a subheading, you know. This isn't, this isn't the main thing. This is a subheading. This is all these other things are addressed under the banner of salvation, you know. But that's not, that's the mo not the most important matter. You don't emphasize that. That's that the eyes your understanding might be enlightened. You might see the hope of his calling. That's, that's the high calling. That's what you want to be focused on, the hope. Amen. Amen. That's right. yeah, that you may know. Now, later on in the chapter, he, he says it this way, that, that you might be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the uh, love of Christ with past knowledge. In other words, it's, it's not a two-dimensional knowledge. You know, It's not something that can just be defined in two dimensions. This is a... This is something that's going to take some, some exploration. It's something that no matter how much you dig down deep into it, there's going to be more to find. And more specifically, that, that you may know, as I said, the hope of his calling. This hope, is, it's a lively hope that we have been begotten Amen. again unto. It's, this is a hope of better things to come. It's otherwise referred to as this blessed hope. Now, this is a hope which is in its nature not seen. It's, it's not something which we can see with our eyes now. It's, it's a hope that's rooted in things that are yet to come to pass, things that are, are eternal. They're not temporal in nature. And it is for this reason that I find it so detestable that we have in our day people who, are, who say, yeah, the, the, the uh, phaser, favor of God is uh, um, shown by all these riches and all these other things, you know, within this context, how ridiculous does this whole health and wealth movement sound? That the, the hope of things eternal, the hope of things to come, this is where our focus should be. And we have these people that are drawing our focus down to the earth. Yeah. How contradictory is it to this, this text and this whole idea that we're talking about today? Hope, uh, 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 the, the apostle goes into this too. He says, hope that is seen is not hope. 
For if a man hopes for that which he's seen, he, uh, you know, what doth he yet hope for? But if he hopes for that which he has not seen, then he, he does with patience wait for it. So we're to, we're to do everything in our power not to be rooted and grounded in earthly possession, because our hope is, po- is one that's pointed heavenward. Amen. More specifically, it's, it, it is the hope of eternal life. It's the anticipation of the day when we will shed this body of flesh and put on our house which is from heaven. Uh, the, the anticipation of being delivered from the bondage of corruption, which we are now currently under. To be able to be brought to this state of glorification in which we'll be able to, without hindering influence, serve our God. This is something that's it's, it's kind of a um, foreign concept to us now to even think about serving God without any opposition. It's a, it's a good thing to think about. It's a thing that blesses the soul to even think about that you're going to be able to serve God without any kind of hindering opposition. That's, that's the hope that we're hoping for, the hope of eternal life. And this is also the hope of the gospel. This, this is the primary message of the gospel. It's hope. As I said, it's, it's not improving your life here or having a better family or having a better job. It's, it's not better circumstances in the world. It's hope. That's, that's the, the, uh, it's the hope of the gospel. And that's also the hope of glory. This is uh, the hope that we're hoping for is that we're going to be glorified together with him. This goes along to all the things that we're going to be doing in the ages to come. And we just talked about this in the last men's meeting again. It blessed my soul to just think about it. The the hope of glory, all the things that are involved in being glorified with Christ, that we're going to judge the world, that in the ages to come we might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness towards us. You know, everything that's involved with that, we're going to be a royal diadem in the hand of our God. the, The hope of glory. It's a good thing to think about. It is a better hope, too. This is a better hope. Because this is a hope by which we draw, we draw nigh unto God by this hope. Now, this isn't, as the Word uses the term, a, a vain, I hope so kind of hope. You know, I think that this, the term has been pretty well neutered nowadays. It's, it's more synonymous with wish than what the Word actually means. Uh, scripturally, this means that you are desiring for something to come to pass. Well, the, the way that they use it, basically, you're desiring for something to come to pass, but you don't have complete confidence or control over the matter, so you just hope that things might work out the way that you want them to. Uh, really, what it is, it's uncertainty guised in optimism, is what it is. But that's, that's not what our hope is. That's not, we are hoping for something that's sure to come to pass, something which we can and which we do have confidence in. This is something that is solid as God himself because he is the one who has determined to bring it to pass. He is the one who has promised that these things that we we are hoping for now will one day not be hope, they will be a reality. We are, this is something that, that, this is a hope which we have as an anchor of the soul. These are things that you can live by. This hope is what enables us to be able to reason rightly concerning the sufferings of this present time. So as we're able to see, as we're able to take a hold of this, to be able to understand it, we can reason. We actually can reason that these sufferings in the present time aren't worthy to be compared with what awaits us. Amen. This, this, can, this actually must be seen. If someone is to, going to live in this world and going to make it to glory, this has to be seen. This is not, this is not uh, uh, something that's nice. This is a requirement to be able to, to live through this world, to be able to hold on through the tempestuous sea of all the trials and tribulations and everything that a person goes through in the world. You have got to be able to have a, a, a view of this hope, to be able to hold on. A shallow view of these things is not enough to sustain you. You have to be able to have a view to the end of these things. Now, this is what enables us to be able to consistently cast off the work of darkness and put on the armor of light. 
is being, being able to have a view to the end of these things. Having a clear, unobstructed view of our role in the ages to come and the glory which we'll be partakers of in Christ Jesus, it even makes the temptations of the wicked one, which might otherwise be difficult to overcome, and perhaps they may have even snared us at one point in time, easily refused and cast away from us. You, th you can think back uh, in your fellowship with the Lord. There may have been some things that you, you, had, you had some serious difficulty with in the past. And there was a time where you were just delivered from it. And now you don't have problem with that anymore. Because the devil doesn't have that in you anymore. You can just say, no, no, devil, I'm not doing that anymore. Amen. This actually greatly simplifies life. As we're looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, and as we're walking in the Spirit, we're actually saved from all manners of blunders that we would have done if we hadn't been doing so. It's, uh, he talks about it in this way, too, that, the, that salvation, uh, we've been given, um, uh, the, I want to think of how it says it, as a, a helmet, the hope of salvation. It's like I, as you're wearing this helmet, as you're considering this, it's like a protection for you, you know? It protects you from all manners of evil to be able to, to have this on your mind, so to speak. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now, this really is the point of our salvation, the, the, the culmination of our hope. Even as the apostle states, he says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. I mean, it's, it's, it's not about here. It's, it's, it's about there. It's about what's, what's to come. That they might be, he, he, the, the apostles desiring that the Ephesians might be acquainted with this overhead view of salvation, of the salvation of God. That they might have an awareness of the purpose of God in Christ Jesus. This is something that is necessary. It's absolutely essential for those who are in Christ to eventually come to the point where this knowledge comes home to them. That they, they have to be acquainted with what God is doing in the church through Christ if they're going to be participants in it. Amen. To some degree, you have to know what God is doing in Christ if you're going to put your hand to the work. If we're going to be workers together with him in this thing, we have to know, you know what he's doing to some degree or another. I understand we're all on uh, varying levels of this. Some of us may have been a lot in a lot longer than others, but... The, the, there's no room for ignorance in this. There's no excuse for someone who's been in Christ 50, 60 years to have a, a, a woefully ignorant view of this. It's, it's something that, that has to be done. You know, it's, it's through understanding that, that you, you enter into these things. This is the way that God's designed it. You know? he's, not, he's not bringing people to glory outside of their um, willing participation in it. That this is what brings him glory in this. That that, that uh, uh, mankind who once was evil and wicked and who, who did things that were contrary to him, uh, he's actually redeemed them and made them willing in the day of his power. That they that these creatures who who did these things now are actually the complete opposite. That he doesn't even have to tell them specifically what to do, that they are actually so much like his son Christ that he can trust them with a great amount of responsibility and they can, with, a, with very little direction, just do something. Do, do, in fact, do what the Lord would do in that circumstance. You have to have this, this, this view of it that, um, that ultimately they're not for themselves. And that uh, the church is, in fact, Christ's inheritance. That uh, we're, we're being made for a habitation of God through the Spirit. That that's, that's the point of all this, that we're being crafted into this glorious church. That we're fundamentally not individuals. I mean, we, are, we do have individual fellowship with God, but... Uh, on a on a, a fundamental level, we are the body of Christ. We're not separate believers. We are the bride of Christ. We have to be able to see this, that Christ in us and us in Christ is not primarily just to benefit us. But uh, as aggregate, we are Christ's inheritance. Uh, it, see, it talks about this in Psalm chapter 2. So ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Or this is, you know, part of what was promised to Christ for this, this work that he has done in salvation. Now, this is a point which is made several times in the epistles. It's one that's, 
actually brings encouragement to our hearts every time we consider it that we've actually been so much joined to Christ that all of these things which has been promised to him, all of these uh, uh, various promises that the, the God has promised the Son because of the work that he has done in redemption, we're actually partakers of those things because we have been joined to him. Amen. And it says in Ephesians 3, 6, it's talking about... Um, the Gentiles and the Jews being joined, but it also talks about us being fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And, if, and in Romans 8, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And that's a, a very profound consideration that all of these things, um, we're going to be glorified together with him. So today, as we uh, um, continue uh, speaking of these things about this illumination, its, it's redemptive function, the subject of this preaching festival, um, I just, uh, thinking about this, the enlightenment, the, it's just blessed my soul to be able to, to think about this subject, that God, God has chosen to do this in a, a, an economy of knowledge, that he is not redeeming man outside of an intelligent fellowship with him, and that he is doing this. He's crafting this church um, to the end that they might be uh, um, workers together with Christ, and that as, as an aggregate whole, that uh, they might be able to do things for God that nobody else could do. You know, the church uh, in its final form is, is going to be able to do, to do a work for God that no other created being is able to do. Because of the, the finished product, because of what they are, what God has made them throughout this process of salvation, uh, it's, it's going to be a glorious thing. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother.